Okay, we are live on our February Google Hangout, and today actually is National Clean Out Your Computer Day, which is kind of ironic and fabulous that we have a wonderful guest with us. Um, first, I'll introduce Mindy, Mindy from our team here at Social Connects, because Mindy had this awesome connection with Angela from Major Mom. And Mindy, you, I'd like you to kind of tell us your connection, and then introduce, we'll bring in and introduce Angela. Hi, Angela. Thank you for joining us today. I had the privilege of having one of the Major Mom Liberators come into our home about two years ago. She totally transformed uh, how our home is run and managed for our family. It's made such a difference. And not only did they come in and help organize us, but she really uh, personalized it for our family and how we function and how we operate within our home, really made it personal and then taught me the tips on how to continue that organization going forward, not just a come in and do it and then it just goes back to how it was. She really took the time to teach us how to do that. So when we discovered about National Clean Out Your Computer Day, I said, Gina, we need to have Major Mom on here for digital decluttering tips. And we reached out to Angela and are so thrilled that she's here today to join us. Thank you, Angela. Thank you, Mindy and Gina. It's great to be on, and I, I am so honored that you thought of us. Yeah, well, what a perfect day to have you here. And can I just get you to share briefly, how did you decide to start Major Mom? Well, I, I was a major in the Air Force when I became a mom. So my nickname became Major Mom when my uh, when I get home from duty, my husband would say Major Mom is home and hand me my baby girl, and then we had a baby boy. And um, at that point, I decided that military life and motherhood were completely incompatible for the kind of mom that I I just dreamed of being. I wanted to be, and I thought, okay, I'm going to uh, quit this career. And pretty much about six months after I quit my career, a very long 14-year career in the service, uh, my husband's real estate business uh, went down the drain. <laughs> and so we had to go back to the drawing board. My, my stay-at-home mom uh, time was short, but at the same time it was wonderful. And my husband said, you know, you're really organized and you, you tend to help all the neighbors and your friends and family. Maybe you could do this as a career or a job and I thought that was the most ridiculous thing I'd ever heard. <laughs> what do you mean do it for a career? I mean this is something I do for fun. I love doing this. Nobody does their passion for a career. <laughs> so he said maybe you should look into it and um, after hanging around a couple of stay-at-home moms who were living in utter chaos I just really grew a heart for moms. I said you know it's hard enough being a mom and raising a family and add clutter and mismanagement of time on top of it, it almost becomes a terrible journey. So I thought, you know what, we can make motherhood and having a household a little bit more fun by creating a company full of liberators, we call ourselves, to help others get organized in their homes, their cars, and their offices. That's awesome. I think that's such a great story. I love it. And the whole thing of the liberators, it is it is liberating. And, and I'll let you know, I just went through a move. So I'm in a temporary apartment until we close on a new house in um, a new apartment in Chicago, moved from Colorado. And I was telling Mindy, just the fact of purging so much before we moved was liberating. It felt good just to get rid of after living 13 years in a house. Um, and it is something that we know, clearing clutter helps us, but you know, looking at kind of the digital, do you find a lot of people struggle when they're um, cluttered physically? Do they tend to also have digital clutter? Oh yes. <laughs> that is definitely now the new horizon for, for clutter and it is so overwhelming the number of pictures that people can take and then to try to do something with. It's overwhelming and unfortunately what happens is years and years and years go by and um, the, you know, the pictures are stuck here in the phone or maybe in the camera itself if they have a real camera and there's just all these fabulous memories stuck in these digital formats. I thank God that there's very little storage on these phones because it forces you to get the pictures off or you can't take it anymore. And I wish they wouldn't have so much storage on the cameras. 
Or you do like me, you just go buy another SIM card and put it in another SD card. <laughs> Which is what I just did too. <laughs> I know. We're so glad you're here with us today. <laughs> That's that, that, Angela, that, that, brings, that brings us to a great point because in social media marketing, we're always telling our clients and people who follow us online, get out there, take pictures. It's all about visual storytelling now and people want to see behind the scenes. And so we're encouraging others to take pictures, but as a result of that, we have full, you know, cards and overflowing SIM cards and, and whatnot, and then it goes on our computers. So that was one question that I definitely wanted to touch on here today was how do you suggest photo management for people? Besides getting rid of one's SD card. <laughs> <laughs> well, the first tip, I hope everybody's listening. Tip number one, never go buy more storage. That is a <laughs> sign of a problem. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll admit <laughs> That's the first sign of a lack of a system. Um, the, the second thing I'd like to say is absolutely take all those pictures, have some fun, post it on social media, but then you can, you can delete all of those. They're already out there. They're already in your account. So once you've posted them in your own social media accounts, they're there. So you don't need them in your phone. So that's the second kind of philosophical an, uh, answer. But the third kind of more important is have a system in place that actually gets the, the pictures off the phone every, every second and every um, SMA, every minute that you're taking pictures. It's going up into the cloud, and therefore, they, if you lose this phone, um, which I've heard people do, um, <laughs> if the phone gets stolen, which I hear happens, if things, something happens to this, you have all your, your pictures already in the cloud and everybody has a different way they can do that versus iPhone or Droid. My favorite way is I have Dropbox, um, I have a Dropbox account. Dropbox allows you to upload um, your pictures. I think it's, oh, I think it's free um, because they want people to use the, the Dropbox service. And every picture I take is automatically in the cloud and then when this starts to get full or is full, like it'll say you're you know low on storage, I just go into the camera and gallery, delete all with full confidence because I know it's all in Dropbox. And then I can click on my Dropbox app and go to my camera uploads and they're all there. So it's happening automatically. That's the first part of having a system. That's not the whole system, but it's a good start to not yeah. Get more and more and more storage. Yeah, I love, I, and I have that feature where mine always upload to camera uploads folder. I wish that it had a, a way that, that you could, when it moved over there, that you could title the picture because the fact that they're not titled, you do have to make a commitment. I try to do it once a month where I go in and name and delete pictures that, um, because I tend to take way too many pictures, but naming them. And then figuring out, are they in my family folder? Are they in my this folder, that folder? Is helpful. Do you do you create subfolders within your camera folder? Absolutely. And I think it's really better to keep it simple. So um, what I do from Dropbox is I just have three folders. One is family. One is you know business, whatever you can name it, major mom or business. And the other is friends and social. So you know, if it's really family and those are going to go in a different photo album eventually, then maybe some of my social gatherings with the girlfriends and things like that. So that's how I do it. I keep it really big and simple because from there, when I'm ready to create an online photo album, I can pull them by date and, and put them in and put the, you know, the information. So I, I have this ready for you guys because this is one of my online photo albums that I also printed out and it's called um, it's called the first decade so of my marriage with my husband and basically what we did was um, upload them to heritage makers there's there's numerous sites that you can upload and then you have this wonderful what we call a legacy for our children and they love looking at it since we're talking about pictures this was so great because 
you know, people are like, oh, well, that's that's you know, that's very collagey. Yes, you may not like my style, or it might not look perfectly um, left brain linear. But the thing is, I have this 50 page coffee table book that is documenting our life together as a family. And what we try to tell our clients is, what is the point of taking all those photos if they never get captured into a legacy event like a book or an online photo album? And the great thing is with Heritage Makers, and I don't sell it, but I just love their program, um, I can send the link to everybody I know. I can post the link on social media, and they can flip through this book like like an online magazine or a book they just you know click and it turns the page they can see the whole thing on their big computer screen and that is a cheap and expensive way to share your life with other people in a nice legacy format oh I love that I too. that's great I have not heard of the heritage, heritage makers okay that's a great I, I'm writing that down <laughs> that's heritage a great take they have Snapfish, um, iStock, or not iStock, iPhoto, and anything on the iPhones. Um, iPhoto has a situation where you can take those and upload them and print them out. So iPhones have a lot of that technology built into it. Um, some people know how to use it, some don't. But what's most important is a lot of perfectionists that we work with get so hung up on trying to find the perfect system that they're going to use that they never make a decision and never do anything. That yeah, I was gonna say I could see where that um, where, where you get stuck. Um, oh, and Kimberly is listening in, and she says hello, Angela. Kimberly Orr, you know Kimberly. Hello, Kimmy. <laughs> <laughs> Kimmy, <laughs> that's right. Um, so okay, most of us are as Mindy called it in in uh, an email as digital pack rats. <laughs> <laughs> and Mindy, you're probably one of the queen of digital pack rats because you read <laughs> so much online. I do. I have a great system I use. Well, not system. I have <laughs> a great tool that I use called Pocket. It's getpocket.com, and you you install it as an extension in Chrome. And whenever you come across an article that that I want to read, uh, either for marketing for myself or for my clients, uh, respective to their industries. I just click the little pocket icon and it saves it for me that I can read it later because I when I'm you know I have my schedule of how I do uh, the management for my clients and so I want to bookmark those for later use what I find is I need a system in place of when do I go in and organize those articles or read them and use them and delete them so it is a digital pack rat system so <laughs> Angela how would you advise <laughs> how would you advise organizing that I think that it's uh, the, the one thing that we can really fall into a trap um, is to save, save everything that seems interesting versus quickly looking at it, gleaning in, any information from it, and del pressing delete. Sometimes there's a, a fear factor in getting rid of information, and we call that um, infomania. So, <laughs> um, it's easy to be an infomaniac these days because you you uh, we have clients that have stacks and stacks of magazines and now they have stacks and stacks of um, things to read whether it's digitally or in a physical form those stacks be, start to become a lot of um, stress and pressure of I should I need to I need to read this I need to know this so the first part of my answer is is yes if you're going to keep a lot of reads to reads they do eventually need to have big categories in other words you could have clients personal you know really right. high arching categories right and I have that now set up to where they get a tag right when I save the article and I have it tagged per client or I have perfect. it for personal. perfect and that's and that's such a great system because on Google you can search for those tags you can look up the tags so that's a great system um, and then once you are ready to read something for that client because you're helping them, that to me is a sufficient system. What okay. tends to happen is they don't get tagged, so you're doing great by tagging them. But what happens for a lot of people is they just put them into the, a read folder, if you will, or read later. tag, you know, clag it. And then 
they you know they're searching and looking for what was that article or what was that article um, not realizing that they probably when they're ready to do that project for the client they could have just googled that and found that article again you know pretty easily or maybe even a better article so saving everything is not recommended what you do save needs to be categorized and organized and then at some point you need to have a purge time you know whether it's December 31st you know if you're getting ready for the new year or my favorite time to purge is January the whole month of January just get you know pulling paper files getting the digital stuff purged and saying okay I can release this going through your digital files pictures and just purging away and delete 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 and saying, okay, I kept that for a year. I used it once. That's cool. But now I don't need that again because what the data is already old. In this digital right. age, after a year, it may may not even make sense to keep anything about marketing or the internet. <laughs> right, right. And that's one thing that we use as well uh, for our clients is Pinterest. And I know I'm sure there are lots of people that could use an organizational system in Pinterest. We're allowed to create boards, but you're also allowed to just like. And that turns into that same, okay, I'll look at this later. I might want to pin it to a board, but I might not. And then where's the system of bringing that in? One way I use Pinterest for clients is to have, I have collaborative boards with my clients where it's a private board, so the public's not privy to the information, but I can send articles or photos or content ideas to my client, and then they can approve it or comment back. So that's a way that I've found uh, to use Pinterest successfully and then our team uses it to share quotes. We, we enjoy sharing inspirational quotes, motivational quotes, and tips. And so we have a board that is just for our team that we can all pin to it and then pull from that as we're curating and creating content. What are some tips you have for Pinterest that we might be able to tap into as well? Well, Pinterest is so fabulous, and it is really for me. It's 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 a such a wonderful visual representation of of the ideas. Major Mom has, I would say, a very organized Pinterest um, account and boards. And our boards are uh, it's easy to figure out what board you want to go to 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 find organizing solutions. Um, but we could we could load up those boards with with things you know we could clutter our boards with stuff that that really isn't appropriate so I think that what you're doing with the collaborative boards is amazing and is a is a good thing to do however the one thing that we caution about Pinterest is adding too much because then it's so visually overwhelming and overstimulating right. that the idea gets the, I guess the essence of the idea gets lost. Okay, that's a great that's a great tip. The next thing that I wanted to ask you about is the elusive uh, feat of inbox zero, <laughs> and how we can be more organized and declutter our inboxes. I what got are one time? <laughs> <laughs> it's nightmarish. It's a it's. It's such a nightmare for all of us because the people um, love our paper management class because they say papers are their number one nightmare, and that counts for emails. You know that counts for the digital things as well. Even though the format is not, you know, this piece of paper, it's still something you have to track and manage. So I say the number one tip I have for managing your inbox is aggressively unsubscribe to everything that comes into your inbox the moment it comes in if it's something you did not want and I know this is hard for women to do but even if the newsletter comes from your friend's company or your friend suggested it and then she wants to talk about it and you're like oh my gosh I have to read this and talk to her about it I think that one thing we always tell our friends and family is you can unsubscribe to the major mom newsletter whenever you want we only want you to read it if the tips are actually helping you so the number one thing that most people in the United States could do right now is go through their inbox and unsubscribe unsubscribe to um, things that the AAA and, and all these things that you get sent from your companies, Comcast. I mean, they're probably one of the worst offenders out there, where they'll figure out ten different ways to get get you some kind of information. And unsubscribing is extremely healthy. 
then um, if you, depending on how you like to organize your inbox, it's critical not to have one inbox with no subfolders on the side. That is so unmanageable. And um, I've seen people with 5,000 emails and they're like, well, I just search in the search bar for the email. And I'm like, well, that's a lack of a system. That's not really a system. And it's still overwhelming to the human body to see 5,000 in the inbox. Even taking all those old ones and moving them over to already read, so the fresh ones only come in during that day, is very helpful. So people are like, well, but then I'll forget to go, I'll forget to go look at them. And like, you're already forgetting to look at them. <laughs> they're they're right. 5,000. So, well, and one thing that uh, our liberator Mandy taught our family, which I think so supply, so applies to our inbox topic, is everything has a place. There are systems, and every every item in your home should have a place that it belongs. And I liken that to in our inboxes, every every email should have a place that it goes, whether it's to read, to follow up on, uh, what action item do we need to take, or do we unsubscribe? Absolutely, and the inbox is not the place for emails that have already been read. They are only for incoming. That is a great tip. So inbox is only for incoming mail, not the catch-all 5,000 plus messages that we tend to leave in there. <laughs> Which is such a smart, so it's really creating those folders for the emails that you're getting on a regular basis or from specific people and then like you said deal with them right away or delete them move them move them over something just get them out of your view because it is it's overwhelming I have right now 300 and even that is too many to sit there and go through and I do the thing of search for all emails from a specific person to, to narrow what I'm searching for and I still go okay this is crazy and it is, it is like if you do it, a fun exercise today, just move all of those emails into an action folder so that you know you really still wanted to do something with that. Um, but it's not an urgent folder. It's just an action, meaning you really did maybe want to respond. You did want to maybe um, go to the links. There was something that you still wanted to do with it for, for whatever reason it didn't get deleted. And then that way you have this glorious feeling today, if you did this today, of only the new incoming come in. You've, if you don't take action on it immediately, just move it over to the action and create a new new way of doing doing life by then going to the action folder and checking through it. When you have some time to go, okay, I'm at the airport for two hours. Let me go through all those emails that I've been wanting to read and for some reason did not delete at that time. And you'll what, notice that you delete a lot. Yeah. What's your thoughts on Google's new inbox? Because they have that where it'll boomerang back to you and you can set reminders for emails. Do you have you played with that or do you recommend that? I do not want anything to boomerang back to me. Why would I want it to hit my inbox three times? That that would just be <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so five times is too many then I take it. I, I definitely don't want to mail stuff back to myself and, and, and go into a heart attack, cardiac arrest situation. So I think that's a horrible <laughs> idea. But you know, maybe maybe it works for some people. But and if it's urgent, it's getting taken care of. If you have an urgent client issue, you took care of that. If someone sent you a proposal, okay, you don't have a timeline. It's just going to sit and float in that inbox. Everything that we need to do as human beings that need to get taken care of that day is getting taken care of. Everything else is fluff, and it's just hard for us to separate ourselves from. Therefore, it doesn't need to stay in the inbox, but it does need to be addressed, either deleted or responded to or read. That is a, that's a great, t I'm writing that down, that's a tweetable. It doesn't need to stay in the inbox, <laughs> but it can, be, it can be addressed. This brings me to the next topic, Angela, that I'd love for you to touch on, and that goes into our screens. So we've talked about decluttering different parts of our computer. What about the screen and all the little icons? What do you recommend? A clean screen, just a few icons. I know there are some desktops that are filled with apps and uh, sites to see. This is such a fun topic because depending on whether you're left brain or right brain, what I'm about to say is going to hit you 
um, <laughs> in a certain way. So in other words, a left brain dominant person like me cannot handle all that, all those icons on the desktop. A right brained creative may actually be able to track all those icons. There really is a difference in how a left brainer and a right brainer need to organize data. That difference cannot be changed or over, overridden by you know, forcing our husbands to uh, use a left brain linear file system when there really are right brain creatives and use colors and other things to, for their mind to find things. So with that said, if you don't know if you're left brain, kind of linear, one, two, three, four, or right brain, a nonlinear kind of circular organizing system when it comes to digital, um, it's important to give two solutions for the desktop. One for the left brainer. The left brain person who likes linear and not a lot of visual clutter will have the main icons on their desktop that they use every day, all the time and that's all they have and that's kind of on the left side on the right side of their screen what we will tend to help our clients do if they're left brainer is have the projects that they're working on at the time a contract that they're revising um, something that they're editing at the time it's a hot urgent thing and they want to work on it on their desktop once it's completed and final documents are saved then the desktop gets cleared off so we really teach people to use it as your desk, your desktop. What would you have out? And right-brained individuals tend to have 100 documents on their desktop, all the apps and icons. It's very overwhelming for a left-brained person to even use a right-brained person's computer because you're thinking, oh my gosh, I, I this you don't have any folders. This is very difficult. And when we sit down with the right brain, they're like, oh, yeah, but I know where everything is. I know where everything is. We'll play a little game and say, okay, um, can you find, and we'll say, the document that you're working on with client so-and-so, and where are you in that, in that process? I assure you that they will scan that desktop and scan the desktop, looking all over and looking and searching and and, and it's not that we like to say, well, I told you so, that's not a system. It's more to just say, let's get real about this. You actually don't know how to find it when you slam everything onto your desktop. And even creating for a right brainer, this is a right brain solution and a left brain solution, even creating a couple of desktop folders that say current projects, then like you can have 50 things in there. But the cool thing about it is when you click on that folder, they come, they, they, they come by date order or alphabetical, however you want, and then you can actually find everything related to that client, that project. So sometimes you say, hey, right, Rainers, go ahead and throw some folders wherever you want them, you know, left, right, all over, but then throw the stuff into that folder to make it more manageable and spend less time searching for documents. Okay, that's a great system to create and have a place for everything. That, that is, is a great my, tip. Yeah, my, my thing is I'm a tab person where I keep tabs, too many tabs open, and then on the bottom I have a Mac, and so then at the bottom I have my important icons, and then I'll flip from Word documents I'm working on. So same thing, I need to do more of a system where I've got one place to look. And My tab thing is to avoid saving everything into, into like, pocket. I just figure when I'm done reading it, I close the tab. But 28 tabs later... Um. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like they give us a rope to hang ourselves. You know, you shouldn't be able to have 28 tabs of You should say, Max, Max, Max overload. Yeah. But, you know, it does. And then the next thing you know, you're like, where, where, where was I? But the funny thing about Macs versus PCs is Macintosh computers are right brained, creative designed computers for right brain creatives. So when you when you pull up you know the documents on on a Mac when you click on doc what does it do? Yeah, it makes like this rainbow of documents. Rainbow of document is so right brain so creative. And for a left brain person, I just get so annoyed because I'm like, why is that so you know like this? They're not like, colorful. Like here's all your documents. It's like a welcome to what you're working on. But it makes sense. 
that a left brainer struggles with a Mac, struggles, doesn't really know why they feel so out of control of their computer. Makes you anxious. <laughs> sure. yeah. yeah, you keep thinking, can I get it to stop go doing that when I open? <laughs> So, Angela, what would you say is one of the top struggles that you find when working with your clients? What digital struggles do you see most? The biggest digital, digital struggle that we see is um, the inbox that you've already mentioned and the number of pictures. It is the thing that overwhelms them and lets them, uh, maybe even keeps them awake at night. Like, oh my gosh, I have so many pictures. I promised my husband I'd get that wedding album done 12 years ago and it's not still done. Or, oh my gosh, my mom's retirement party is next week and I have not gotten that together. Or, my son is graduating and I promised myself I would get the baby book done. And he's 18. And all this stress and this pressure of, I just have so much. I have, I have thousands to look through. And a lot of times what it does take is hiring a professional organizer or a digital photo organizer, somebody that can kind of come 50 feet out, you know, and look and go, I'm going to help you pick the best ones for that book. Like an outsider saying, here's really some great ones. The rest can go away forever or you can just put them in a folder um, first 18 years of my son's life. <laughs> You know, they are arranged by date order. And then if you want to create something fun, you know, like this. The other thing I want to say is, guess what? If we didn't have this in order, you know, ours goes from 2000, it says right here, 2001 to 2010. It goes basically in order. But each page itself is not necessarily the order that it happened in that year because it doesn't matter. Does that make sense? That it, does make sense. It, it really does. It's captured, and that's the important part, is that it's captured. Yeah. You could create a photo album for, for 2014 that, that you pull every single 2014 picture that you took all last year. You can slam it on five or six pages or 100 and call it a day. Angela, that, that's there. it. Those are some great tips. I know our listeners are going to eat this up and take action. I know what I'm going to do right when we wrap <laughs> this. I'm going to get on my Mac and organize my little rainbow floating things into folders. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing time with us today. You've been such a value add to our audience. Angela, tell us if someone wants to reach out to you and Major Mom for help either in their home or in their office, what's the best way to reach you? The best way is to go to our website, which is majormom.biz, B-I-Z, majormom.biz. You can look at our before and after gallery. You can read all about our liberators. You'll see pictures of us, and you can click on a little button that says hire us now. So that's the best way to kind of find out more about us. We are in Chicago, Tulsa, Denver, Colorado Springs, and Phoenix. I think I'll be looking for someone here in Chicago as soon as we get into our new place. All right, give me a call, Gina. <laughs> Thanks so much, Angela. Thank you, ladies. It's so helpful. Bye, ladies. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.